Hello everyone and welcome to Pearson's Learning Makes Us webinar series. Today's session is Engaging Students in the Flipped Classroom and is being presented by Dr. Matt Stoltzfus. And with that, Matt, I'm just going to hand it over to you. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone for participating today uh, in, in this webinar. Um, as Aurora mentioned, uh, there's you can ask questions kind of at any time. I can see the chat window. It's, it's visible to me as I'm giving the presentation. So if you have any questions at all, please uh, feel free to ask them, and I will do my best to kind of keep up with them uh, throughout the talk as well. I'd like to make this as interactive um, as possible. But um, today I kind of want to talk about how um, I like to engage students uh, in the flip classroom. I've been flipping my class, um, geez, it's been uh, about four or five years now, and um, kind of picked up some strategies along the way, and I've also added a few things in that can actually be implemented for in a non-flip classroom uh, as well. So um, one of the things that we're faced with, um, especially for myself, um, to, just to give a little bit of background, I teach general chemistry at Ohio State University. So I have 300 students in each class, and I typically teach uh, two classes per semester. So um, I, I have about 600 students that are taking general chemistry. And that you know, poses a few challenges, and we also see these challenges in small classes as well. Um, and number one, what is the background that our students are coming into general chemistry with, and you know, is that going to help them succeed in the course? Uh, number two, um, do your students come to lecture prepared, and uh, what would it look like if we had them prepared for lecture, and how could we modify what we do in the lecture space if the students are actually prepared? Um, and number three, do our students have really good you know, critical thinking skills, and can they apply what they've learned from previous courses or previous chapters to the, the task at hand? So these are, are, are some big challenges that we're, we're faced with. And then how are we supposed to look at this large variation in how our students are prepared, um, their ability, and also, more, most especially, their motivation um, to succeed? So these questions I'm, I'm going to try to answer and, and, and kind of give my perspective on uh, as we go through um, this webinar. So um, the best thing that you can do to determine where your students are is to give them some type of pre-exam or what I call an entrance exam. And every year, uh, Ohio State students, we're told, have higher and higher ACT scores. They're getting better and better. We get the best and the brightest. So this was from um, uh, last semester. And I gave them a 25-question exam that was on chapters one through three. And here's our distribution. Um, the, the low score was a four out of 25, and the high score was a 22 out of 25. Uh, and we had every number represented in between, and you can see there's a pretty decent distribution here. But um, coming out of high school, for most of our students, um, they're averaging about a 36% on my first exam, which covers the first three chapters. So um, when you talk about variation in preparedness, we have a, quite a bit of, of a variation here. So um, I think step one is identifying where your students are, and then can we give them the tools necessary to uh, succeed and to learn the material in, in, in the best way. Okay, so. Um, I liked, I've been focusing a lot on how do I get my students prepared for class. And I saw this quote in a, a, a talk that I, I attended a few weeks ago. It says, professors don't think students will read, so they cover everything in lecture. Students expect the professor to cover everything in lecture, so they don't read. And if these are our expectations, we kind of are in this loop where you know students aren't doing much before class. And, and I think the first thing that we need to do is set the expectation to prepare the students for class. Okay, so um, I give a pre-lecture assignment uh, at every lecture. I tell the students on the first day of class and remind them consistently throughout the semester that if they're doing this pre-lecture assignment correctly, they need to give me about two hours of their time before um, class starts. In reality, it's probably closer to an hour, but um, I try to tell them to block off two hours of time in their schedule for chemistry before they come to each class. And 
what I found, and I'm sure any of you who are using online homework has observed, is that unless there are points assigned to something, students aren't very prone to complete the assessment. So uh, that's one of the things that, that I, I do, and I use Mastering Chemistry for the pre-lecture assignment. Okay, so for this particular day, we're talking two sections in the textbook. I assign three tutorial problems, which I'll dig into in a bit here. And then I also assign, um, there's a new platform called Perusal, which is being developed by uh, Eric Majeur, Brian Lukoff, and uh, the Learning Catalytics team. Um, they have a new platform where the students read and engage in the textbook before class. So before class, my students are reading the book, and they're also completing three tutorial problems. Okay? So when they click on this um, perusal assessment, uh, they're given the learning goals uh, for, um, for the day. Uh, they're given a brief introduction. Okay? So here I'm introducing molecular orbital theory. And then at the bottom of the page here, it says click the link uh, to open the perusal assignment. And then there are also some lecture videos that are available. Um, I created over, there's over 300 lecture videos um, that are posted on YouTube and that are also on iTunes U where um, anybody in the audience or anyone teaching chemistry, whether it be at the high school level, um, college level, uh, they, you have access to, to using these videos that correspond to the sections of our textbook. So here I've linked four videos, um, molecular orbital theory, molecular orbital diagrams, and second row diatomics. Um, the, and the students have access to these and they can watch them before class. But oftentimes, I, I don't know if the students are watching those videos properly or if a student reads a book before the class, typically they like to highlight and, and, and they highlight a, a, a lot of things and they're not using research-based practices to either watch the videos or read the book. So the question is, how can we help with that? So um, the tagline of perusal is every student prepared for every class. And essentially what this platform is, is you upload really just a PDF of the textbook. Okay? And if you're just looking at this screen, there's nothing you know, really um, fancy about it. It's just you take a, a PDF of the text and you open it up in this platform and the students then can, can read through it. But if you look on the left hand side, uh, in this view you see five little circles. Right? Those five circles are the students that are in this particular module. Okay, and what you do in perusal is you have to make annotations or comments mm -hmm. and then your classmates can comment on them. So uh, for example here, um, the, the student highlighted the rates are always expressed as positive quantities and then they put in um, a comment there over on the left hand side. Okay? Once a student makes a comment, um, anyone else in the class then can comment on top of that or annotate on top of it. In addition, you see there's um, an orange question mark that's uh, posted there. If I'm reading this and I have the same question that was posed by one of my classmates, I can click on that question, which will give uh, an indication to the instructor that they need to um, kind of, uh, that it might be an important question that many students in the class have. Okay, and then um, you know I have a couple other examples here. Um, so in this particular case, the student uh, highlighted it's typical for rates to decrease as a reaction proceeds because the concentration of reactants decrease. So the students have to make a comment or an annotation on this, and and um, kind of it, it helps them number one read the textbook properly based on some research-based strategies that have shown to be effective, as opposed to highlighting, they can't just passively read, right? They have to make a comment on the text. Uh, some of my student, the negative feedback I get from this is, this is so much harder than just reading the book. I don't know why you're making me do this. And um, it's kind of, you know, that's what I was hoping for, right? That the students would actually read and dig deep uh, into the content. Um, an another thing that, um, that I like ab about this platform and the thing that I think makes it really successful is that on the right hand side here uh, next to each comment you see a number one and a number two. Um, the thing that the designers for Perusal did 
really well is they captured the fact that students are motivated by points. So um, the instructor can set it up. For me, for this section, um, I usually grade the top three comments from a particular section. And um, these are actually graded by an algorithm that looks at um, their particular comments. If the student here, like this top com uh, student, he's just asking a question that would like to be answered, uh, like don't catalysts also affect reaction rates by lowering the activation energy? If so, how does this happen? Right? They um, propose that comment. You can ask as many questions as you want, but you're graded on your top three annotations. So for example, the student then that answered this question got full credit, whereas I encourage the students to ask as many questions as they want or say, I really don't understand this topic. Then their classmates can also indicate that they're not understanding, so that can help me uh, in class. So I've taken some screenshots here of, of, a, of a webinar given by Eric Majeur. Um, what he's showing here is the number of students. Uh, he assigns his assignments per chapter. So the number of chapters that the students have read before class, he's getting over 85% of the students reading everything except one chapter uh, in, in the textbook. And um, he was very happy uh, with that. So you know, in terms of what's the advantage of perusal versus a video um, to get the students prepared, um, videos are, are really passive. There's a lot of data suggesting that the attention time uh, tanks as time passes, not only in a video, but also in a lecture. And it's a very isolated experience. Okay? Uh, as opposed to a book, the transfer pace is set by the reader, right, and the viewer is more active. The, the thing with the textbook, though, is it's also an isolated experience. So what Perusal did was they kind of brought all of this together and then um, came up with a platform um, to allow students to read the text and get graded on it before class. Um, from an instructor standpoint, it's really easy to set up. And the really cool thing is that I get what is called a confusion report for each section um, before I go into class. And this takes merely seconds to generate. And in this particular case, um, the students have different questions on acid-base indicators and you know, reaching the equivalence point. So it's taking, um, for my students, I usually have over 2,000 comments per section. And it's taking those 2,000 comments and distilling them down to 32. So when I go in to teach class, I know exactly what questions the students have and um, if they've been very popular with their classmates or if they have the same types of questions. So this really uh, allows me to get um, what one of my colleagues would call the temperature of the room before I even uh, walk in there. Okay. So then um, once the students read that, I have them also do tutorial problems in Mastering Chemistry. Okay? And um, one of the things I really like about the tutorial problems is, uh, is the feedback with them. So if you haven't read this book yet, I would suggest trying to get it um, on your book list, for the, especially for the summer or spring break coming up. Uh, it's called How Learning Works. It's seven research-based practices for smart teaching. Uh, it was put together by a team at Carnegie Mellon, led by Susan Ambrose. And one of the chapters in this book talks about feedback and what feedback should be for effective, um, you know, smart teaching. Okay? One, it should focus the students on the key knowledge you want them to learn. So I'm selecting the tutorial problems that we're, for, with concepts that we're going to be covering uh, in class. Right? Number two, it needs to be provided at a time and frequency when students will most likely use it. We have a lot of data that shows the peak time that students are using master, the mastering platform and the My Math Lab platform is from 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. And um, it's funny that this changes like as the globe turns, right? You can see um, how whatever time zone a student's in, 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. is the best, uh, most active, right? So it's kind of like an indication to us that if we wanted to have office hours at the most effective time, it would be at 11 p.m. at night. Well, um, I don't, I'm a night person, but I'm not even crazy enough to try that. So um, we need to have feedback and use an online platform that would help with that. And number three, it should be linked to additional practice opportunities uh, for the students uh, to, to help increase their learning. So essentially, when my students are, are trying to solve a problem, um, they could be thinking about a completely different uh, answer, 
and, and all of them could be thinking about a different answer. And um, if you notice, a lot of these answers kind of tie into a Henderson-Hasselbach type of equation. So how do we address the or give feedback to each of these students based on you know what they're doing because the feedback should look like this for each of our students well with with the mastering platform it gives um, the, uh, the actual feedback for these particular common answers and it gives them to the students right in the time that they're taking uh, that particular uh, they're, they're trying to uh, solve that particular problem right so uh, for example uh, the young lady here in the center of the screen, she used um, the the KA instead of the PKA. So it's telling her exactly what to correct in the same way that I would kind of give feedback in office hours. I'm not going to say, no, that's wrong, here's the right answer. I'm going to tell them what they did wrong. Uh, some of this feedback is tied to uh, math remediation. Notice up in the upper left-hand corner, um, this student inverted values for A minus and HA. Um, they may get uh, calculations based on reciprocals and sent out um, to an, an, another link. Um, also with log, logarithmic relationships uh, to get the students to understand those. I, I think that's uh, pretty important uh, as well. Okay, so um, here's a screenshot of one of the tutorial problems that, that I give. Um, as we start um, enhancing the tutorial database uh, for pre-lecture problems, we did something called pause and predict videos. So in this particular video, we, we filmed these, um, and uh, these are available in the Mastering Chemistry Library. Um, and this one right here is on uh, molecular orbital diagrams. So the student can uh, click on uh, the video, watch a, a video where we do some of the common lecture demonstrations. Here uh, we have a magnet and we pour liquid nitrogen and liquid oxygen through the magnet to see uh, the magnetic properties. Right? Then we um, kind of sketch out on the board what the molecular orbital diagram would look like, and um, then we would come up with um, you know, some, some language with um, para and diamagnetic, and then the students can uh, go through and um, do, solve a few problems here. These are the you know, I, I base these off of my lecture notes and the content of our textbook. So um, the students are doing this, they're watching that, they're doing this before class, so they can then bring in any questions um, that they may have for me. Uh, here's another tutorial-based problem um, on molecular orbitals. Uh, if a student has no idea here about the stability of um, F2 versus F2 minus versus F, F2 plus, uh, they can click the hints button down here on the screen and it'll give them some hints of how stability is related to bond order and how they might set up this problem and, and solve it. So the great part about this is the hints are designed so we get most of our students, regardless of ability, to get them to the right answer. And um, they'll do this uh, before class starts. So um, they complete these two assessments and that's kind of like, you know, for lack of a better term, their ticket to class, right? So um, they've read the book. They've done, in this particular case, three tutorial problems before they even get into lecture. So now I'm not introducing molecular orbitals for the first time to the students. Okay, I'm not naive to think that the students are experts, but um, they certainly have a much better grasp about molecular orbitals, and I really, really encourage them to bring questions with them to discuss about this uh, in class. And my classroom has been much more engaging and interactive since I've switched to um, initially the pre-lecture assignments and even more so uh, the perusal assignments. So here's like a, a quick snapshot of, of what my class looks like. This is just the lower uh, portion of the class and um, it's the middle section. There's also a balcony up top and two sections to the left and, and, and to the right. So um, now that the students have a good background of what's going on in, you know, before they get to class, the question is, um, what can we do um, to kind of enhance the class time for the students? And that's where I use a platform called uh, Learning Catalytics. So um, Learning Catalytics allows me to deliver a question to the students, and um, it's if, if none of you have heard of, of learning catalytics, it's essentially a clicker on steroids. Um, but most importantly, uh, learning catalytics is 
a, a platform designed for students based on the pedagogy as opposed to basing it on technology and saying, oh, we're just going to make turn the clicker online. By using a web-based platform, we can do a lot more with a polling system than simply have students answering A, B, C, or D. Okay, so in this case, um, I picked a multiple choice question. Uh, the students are asked to calculate delta H naught uh, for calcium hydroxide, or no, sorry, they're, they're asked to calculate the KSP for calcium hydroxide um, given the temperature, um, an initial temperature, and an initial KSP. Okay, so what happens is, and here is a seat map of, of my classroom, and I can see in real time how students are answering. So when the students come into class, it's almost like picking a seat um, on, on a flight uh, for, uh, for in, on an airplane for one of your flights. The students come in and they select their seat and um, it then knows their location in, in the lecture hall. Okay, and as I hit refresh on my iPad, I can see how the students are answering in real time. Okay, so um, pay attention here to the screen because I'm going to do like a quick time lapse of different screenshots of how that happens and how my students are answering uh, in class here. So um, by the time that the students are done working, I'll say, okay, everyone submit an answer and um, I'm going to um, put you and, and, and have you have a discussion based on the answer. The key thing that Mazur's research shows here is that you do not want students talking to each other in the individual round. This is a lot tougher as the year and the semester goes by because the students start getting to know each other, but really encourage them not to talk to each other in the individual round. Okay, so now we have this map of how the students answered. And in the center block here on the bottom, um, there's five students that answered incorrectly um, with C. Uh, that, that are sitting right in a row. There's also four students right below them that answered B right in a row. And um, if we were doing something like think, pair, share, we would pair these students and put them in a group and most likely the students who answered C could turn to their left and right and they would find that everyone has the same answer and they would think it's right and they would kind of continue on. It's probably likely that they talked a little bit to each other in the individual round. Um, same thing with the students below them in B. They looked in the, next to, to each other. Okay, you got B? Cool. Uh, we got the right answer. And they kind of move on and have a different conversation. But wouldn't it be nice if we could group together uh, the students that answered C and the students that answered B and tell them to kind of argue their answer and discuss what might be right or wrong? Well, um, that's exactly what Learning Catalytics does. And Learning Catalytics places students in groups uh, based on how they answer in that individual round. So that's why it's key for the students to not interact with each other. And you tell them, be quiet now. Um, in, in a few minutes, you'll be able to discuss this with your classmates. So the summary data from this question, we can see that 53% of the students got this correct in the first round. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to group the students. And um, I'll kind of give you a snapshot of, of what this looks like in my class. Um, I've, I've, I've been cautioned to, to be careful about using video in, in a webinar, so I'm not quite sure how this is going to work here, but um, you'll kind of see a snapshot into my classroom. So first, um, I deliver a, a question on Learning Catalytics uh, to the students, and this got delivered to this student's screen right here, and then um, they can work this problem out. So initially, uh, and, and this is also, um, kind of a time lapse where it was kind of fast forwarded so you can kind of get the glimpse of what's going on in lecture. So the students are working individually, not talking to each other. Then they get a note that says, please discuss this with Nick Thomas to your left. So now the students go and talk to each other based on the recommendation that Learning Catalytics gave them and where they are in the classroom um, based on where they're sitting. Because remember, they filled out that seat map and um, they're able to discuss this with each other. So um, one of the things that I'll note is, it, unfortunately, based on the way our classroom is set up, that um, it's very hard to um, you know, uh, facilitate discussion. So this poor student here has to kind of creak his neck around and, and kind of talk to the student behind him. But if I would have simply said, just turn to your neighbor and talk to them, 
there's no way he would have turned around like this and talked to the student behind him because it's inconvenient. But since Learning Catalytics is saying, talk to your classmate um, behind you, right? Um, that's the best conversation that this student could have had for this particular problem. Okay, so um, what it then looks like is I can get round one and round two data. We tell the students to um, re-poll uh, and or to resubmit their answer, and then um, at the in the bottom left you can see something that says one new message. Okay, so um, I can the students can actually type questions to me as they're working things out, and, and I can see their responses and address them, but. Before I revealed the right answer to the students, they went from 53% correct in the first round to 96% correct uh, in the second round. Now, I did cherry pick this question, right, because um, the 31% that answered C, um, they did a math error. They switched the sign using natural logs. So um, what typically happens is that the students who answer incorrectly um, can, can be convinced by the students who answered correctly much more often, especially when a math uh, mistake is involved. One other thing that I do in here, um, when I go from round one to round two, I have a pretty large uh, class. So um, what I do is I, I tell the students that I'm going to call one of them at random, because in addition to having that seat map, if I scroll my finger or my mouse over the seat, I can get the student's name. So I call one student at random to um, deliver the results from their group based on the group discussion. This has incredibly enhanced the group discussion, knowing that um, the students will have to report out to the rest of their classmates. Okay, so um, this is kind of how that is set up. Then after a class, the students can go back in and look at the problems and see what they got right or wrong. If they click on it, um, remember question or point bullet point three from the feedback would be to link it to extra practice. So um, I asked to tell the students if you answered this correct question incorrectly in the individual round and you're having trouble with the problem, they can click on that 14.23 and it'll open the problem right up in mastering. So in your mastering assignment, if the students are logged in, each problem that you assign has a hyperlink to it that you can link um, within a particular system. Here I linked problem 1423 uh, to the students so they can go in and they can uh, work on this homework problem that's related to the question that we did in class. Uh, in addition, um, Newton has an adaptive follow-up engine that it's um, put in most of our, our textbooks and we can um, uh, they, they use an, an adaptive uh, platform to figure out where the students need to go and what path and, and what follow-up assignments they could get uh, in, in order to in, enhance their learning. So that can also be added on to everything that the students uh, are, are doing here. Then there's one last thing I want to talk about here, um, and I, I love this quote from the Bjork Lab. Uh, Becoming maximally effective as a learner requires interpreting errors and mistakes as an essential component of an effective learning rather than a reflection of one's inadequacies. So how can we allow students to fail and not only fail but learn from their failure? So um, every Sunday night at 11.59 p.m. Uh, I have what's called an exam prep assignment that's due. Typically um, they're anywhere, they range from three to five questions, uh, anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. And um, a student clicks start now and a timer starts ticking down. Okay, so when they click start, the assignment opens and they need to complete it all in one sitting. Okay, um, then after the assignment is over, um, they can't access it until the due date and at which they'll be able to see their answers. So what I'd like to do is I take some of my um, more difficult exam questions, I have students work through them, and then um, what I want them to do is redo their work show it to myself in my office hours, to some of the TAs in, in their office hours, or uh, go to our um, teaching assistant center uh, that we have. So essentially, um, the students can take an assessment, and whatever they got wrong, I can allow them to make up some of the points that they missed by going and getting help and reworking the problems. Okay, so what I do is I give them this exam prep follow-up sheet 
they have to indicate the questions they got correct and incorrect, and then they have to work out the solutions um, that they missed. Then they can come to office hours, and um, they'll get a password that opens up uh, what's called an exam prep follow-up assignment. And here, the students are kind of asking questions based on their original exam prep assignment, and then um, they can open up the follow-up assignment and, and, and work on that. So the cool part is, as you can notice, I'm back at the board there um, working on a problem and helping a student, but then these two students here are, are helping each other try to get through uh, the correct response uh, to their questions. So what this does is it helps, you know, give a little bit of structure to office hours. It helps get student traffic to office hours, and it also provides them an opportunity to help each other uh, try to, to get through uh, some of the problems. Um, one thing that I need to work about is uh, how diligently the students work on these exam prep follow-up assignments. Uh, one of my students said on social media someone was asking for this password from my class, and um, I was kind of curious as to how students receive the password. About 36 to 38 percent of them are self-admitting that they just got the password from a friend and didn't really do the appropriate work to get it. Whereas, you know, about 20 to 25 percent of the students actually worked through their problems, came to office hours, showed their work, and really got a, a good experience out of that. So I need to try to figure out a better way to encourage some of the other students to be a little bit more diligent um, in, in their study. So um, that kind of gives you a glimpse of what I'm doing in, in my flipped classroom and how I use uh, Mastering Chemistry, Learning Catalytics, and Perusal to um, not only get the students prepared before class, but to also give them assessments after class. And uh, all those exam prep assignments are, are done in the Mastering platform, and I oftentimes use a lot of the test bank uh, questions that go along uh, with the textbook. So. Um, I'd like to thank you guys uh, for your time today. Um, you can, uh, I have my email address listed at the bottom of the screen. If you have any questions, you can find all my videos on iTunes U and uh, drfoos.com, as well as my YouTube channel, uh, Foos Chemistry Videos. And um, if, if I'm, uh, I'm, I'm pretty active on Twitter, so um, you, you, um, you can follow me there uh, or ask any questions and, and communicate uh, in that way. So I think Aurora has um, kind of a wrap up and can kind of facilitate the, the Q&A. Yes, we do actually have some questions that have come in, so let's just go ahead and get to those. So the first one here is, how do you engage students in a group setting? My students prefer to work individually in group setting and don't interact much with other students. So I think um, the best thing that I saw um, in terms of to help facilitate group work is um, that I, I went to a workshop at Franklin and Marshall College a few summers ago. It was uh, it's a Pogel workshop. If you haven't uh, heard of Pogel, um, Rick Moog from uh, Franklin and Marshall did a fantastic job in um, you know putting materials together for group work and one of the things um, that they do is that when they assign students into groups they assign a task for the student to do and they kind of rotate around those tasks and um, one of the tasks of the students is to keep everyone on task with, with what they're doing so you have like a recorder you have a reporter um, you have a time manager there are different things and one of the things when we tell students okay go ahead and work in groups they don't know what working groups means because most of their previous experience, if they're one of the brighter students in the class, they don't like group work because that means they have to do all the work and they may not trust everyone else to get the work done. So um, one of the things that you really need to do is you need to explain the students what a good group setting would be and how you want that to be facilitated. Right? So for example, um, and, and a nice part about learning catalytics is your place with the students in the group that have all worked on the same question. And what Majeure's research shows is that if a student has ownership in a particular answer, they're much more prone to discuss that in a group. So I think um, one of the first strategies that I would encourage you to do would be to first um, allow the students to work individually and kind of get ownership uh, on, on their answer. And then um, they can go through 
and you know, I, I find the group work is, is a little bit better. Also, calling on one student at random to answer uh, that question has also really enhanced um, the group dynamic in, in my classroom. Great, thanks. So we do have some time for questions here. Just a reminder, go ahead and submit your question in that question panel. And we have a few more minutes. So let's see, there's another question here. Is there any money, is there any cost involved to students using perusal? Um, so right now what the um, folks with perusal are doing, um, they're working with the publisher, so they have a pretty good relationship with Pearson. So I'm doing a pilot, like I'm probably one of the first chemistry instructors to use perusal. I think I was one of the first instructors to use it um, because I had kind of gained a good relationship with Brian Lukoff through um, using Learning Catalytics. So we beta tested this in the fall. It was barely ready before classes started. But um, since I already had that relationship with Brian, I used it. Um, I think right now they're working with a model that it would be like an add-on for the e-text. So um, right now, I believe it's a little over $100 for the students to, to purchase mastering with the e-text. Um, and then that would be another add-on purchase on top of that. So the students would get like a custom link uh, for perusal where they would click on it and there would probably be an add-on. I wouldn't think it would be any more than $100, $125 for perusal, mastering with the e-text, um, and you know, you also get learning catalytics access with that. So with my students, I think in our bookstore, our textbook cost $238, but uh, this year I was able to get the mastering e-text and learning catalytics for 106 which I think is, is a, a pretty good deal, and we need to start trending that way to get the students some um, better cost-effective ways to get their content. Great. Thanks, Matt. So here's another question. Do you know if they work with Sapling Learning HW system? Um, for, when you say they, do you, do you know what that means? Um, no, if you could, I think that one is from Natalia. So if you could elaborate on that question. Oh, they being perusal. Um, perusal is based on, uh, on a, the it's based on a textbook. So if, if I recall correctly, Sapling online homework is not associated with a textbook. So I don't think Sapling's content would work with perusal because you need to upload an, an interactive PDF. OK, great. So we have one last question here. So how do students respond to this class setup? Do they think it's too much work? Um, I think so. I, I see um, a contrast between the first semester students and the second semester students um, that are that are using the, utilizing this setup. The second semester students seem to appreciate it much more, and I think they're in the second semester for for a reason, right? Whereas in the first semester, it's freshmen just coming into college. Um, I think that what I have been trying to do is for the freshmen that are just coming into college, like they're very moldable. So I've been trying to get them, you know, maybe the first week, a uh, certain night, have a study skills session and have them block out their schedule and kind of schedule what you would call quote unquote study halls. You know what I mean? But um, I think up front telling the students, I want you to prepare two hours before each class um, doesn't sound like a lot of work, but then once you get into the hustle and bustle of the, you know, semester and the exams start coming, it starts to become kind of a, a daunting task, but um, you know, my traditional colleagues will say stuff like, um, "For every credit hour that you're in class, you should be spending three hours out of class." And I, I think it's a little bit less than that. What I think is that students don't typically spend that time, and if they're not spending the time doing the homework, um, it, it, it can seem like a, a lot of work. But um, I try to do my best to try to limit the tutorial problems, and then um, try to. Um, pick the ones that are really valuable uh, to the students. All right, we do have another question here. How do you handle excuses or late work? So every assignment is due right before lecture. Um, so uh, I teach Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 11.30, so that's when the assignments are due. Um, I typically give a, a, 
a 1% penalty per hour late. So essentially if a student completely forgot about it and they finish their work at 5 p.m. instead of 11, they'll get you know a 95% on that assignment and they seem to be perfectly fine with that. Um, if a student is sick or has some kind of doctor's note or that kind of stuff, I can go in then and remove the late penalty. And for the pre-lecture assignments, I'm pretty laid back about that, but I don't have too many students. Um, with 1% per hour, they can still be 10 hours late and in their mind get a 90% and, and be cool with everything. So um, it, 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 I think by instituting a late penalty of 1% per hour typically works pretty well. All right, we have time for one more question here. So let's see. How much time outside of class do you spend preparing content? Um, so uh, the, the videos took forever to make, and it, it really, if I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't have made the videos. I would, But perusal didn't exist then. So um, I really like perusal. It's very minimal for me to set up. Essentially what I do is... Um, at least with our textbook, uh, Chemistry of Central Science, um, it's already uploaded. So what the instructor needs to do is create assignments, and you can just use the book and just assign the page range that you want the students to read for a particular day. Right? So um, that takes an hour or two to set up. Um, the confusion reports are really easy to read. Um, uh, also, the very first time you're teaching, and, and assigning the pre-lecture assignments and mastering. It may take a little bit of time, but I've then used those in, in, you know, um, in subsequent years. So uh, it, it's kind of set up fairly well. Um, when I first flip the classroom to ask a question uh, in the, going into class, it takes a little bit of time to come up with really good questions and figuring out what, um, which questions are well suited for class discussion. So um, it, it does take a, a little bit of time, and, and I've been slowly modifying them. But you don't have to do it all at once, right? You, you can kind of you know, start modifying a little bit. And the suggestion that I would have to anybody who's thinking about starting would be to um, use one, um, do one question per lecture, right? Don't just make one chapter completely different. Um, try to design one question per lecture in an interactive way and um, see how the students respond to it. Uh, my guess is that they'll be really engaged during that time and that um, you know you'll see some 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 good results and then you can kind of you know use that to guide how you'll continue to modify your course. Great, thank you Matt. So unfortunately we don't have any more time for any more questions. If we didn't get to your question, we will follow up with you so we make sure that everyone does get their questions answered. And with that, before I close it out, do you have any last words for us, Matt? Um, no, I'd just like to thank everybody for uh, participating today. Hopefully there was something in here that um, you found useful. Um, if, if you like uh, have any other questions, feel free to contact me. and. Um, Thank you for your time. And I'd like to thank you, Matt, for a great presentation today. And thanks, everyone, for attending and for all your great questions. On Friday of this week, we are devoting an entire day to the topic of career development. If you're interested in any of the four sessions you see there on the screen, you can still sign up via the same website you used to register for this session. And do please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up after this webinar is over. We appreciate hearing all of your feedback. And with that, I'll go ahead and say thank you so much for joining us and have a great day.